I've got a crystal house for my missile mind that locks on to the things that I wish were defined in a blanket of stars or a ripple of time where we get to stop, pause, fast forward, or rewind. See, we are all going nowhere. So I became a nomad with no cares, a notepad scribble and soothsayer, a truth slayer with a pen as a sword, swinging a cyclone simile the same as before. See, I am trouble devised inside a subtle disguise in a fake little bubble with a city inside. It's all marketing lies, because five guys in a high rise decide to supersize your fries. So now you've got an ass that is big enough to ride, and you can start a fire from the friction in your thighs. You're sitting on your Velcro couch with a chicken pot pie and a cell phone pouch and a flat screen life like, I'm about to buy a bunch of shit that I don't need. Huh? I mean, what? I get a credit card. I can afford these. I'm gonna get a better car. I'm gonna get a bigger house. I'm gonna get an iPhone. I'm gonna get a leather couch. I get a gym membership that I won't use. I'm gonna pop prescription pills and drink booze. I'm a cop micro fake boobs. I'm a get a pair of baby alligator shoes and a three piece suit. I'm a legend in my own mind. I vote Republican, but I work in the coal mines. I got a fat gut in a George Foreman grill. I got a MacBook loading up my acting reel. I got a pool that I never clean. I'll take a Hummer limousine to the Evergreens, hunt with an M16 and kill everything. I got a barbed wire tattoo cause that shit looks menacing. I leave the house with the lights on. My favorite part of the day is feeding mice to my python. I don't believe global warming exists. It's a myth. Scientists have invented the shit. And I admit there's some climate differences, but that's it. It's just a normal planetary shift. Dude, get a grip. I drive a Mustang, so my mustache is a must-have. <laughs> I wear a musk that is made from a muskrat's nutsack. I have a Snuggie, two pending lawsuits, and a daughter that is thin enough to hula hoop a Fruit Loop. I pick up my wife's dog's Pomeranian poop. My therapist has a therapist, so it's like a whole support group, you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Right? I mean, I'm pro-life and I'm pro-death penalty, and essentially the pressure has been fucking with me mentally. God, tell me what to do. I know that no one is as hypocritical as you. Isn't that true? Oh, we should get some new shoes. <laughs> Let's hit the mall, y'all. Shop till we feel used. I want it all. Call Janie. Tell her where we are. Well, fuck it, she can just record it on our DVR. I'll text her from the car. But bring me Xanax, because Amber's dating Xander, and it's making me all manic. I saw them at the standard getting hammered, and I panic. I just don't understand it. He's taking me for granted. I haven't felt this bad since I saw the Titanic. And to be perfectly candid, I can barely stand it. <laughs> I want to cry, and I don't know why. I want to die, but instead I get go to hide and hide. I'll do anything to distract me from me. Distract me from me. I just want to be the people that I see on TV. I'm the land of the brave and the almost free. I am America, and I'm beautiful as can be. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, listeners. Ben McLeish here of the Zeitgeist Movement UK branch. What you just heard as our introduction was a participant in this year's Zeitgeist Media Festival in the LA event, a gentleman by the name of In Q. Um, he was a spoken word rapper, spoken word slam poetry artist. I'd never seen this kind of um, artwork uh, performed uh, in, in, in public. Um, obviously, coming from Britain, we have a great tradition of what has now become slam poetry in the form of people like John Cooper Clarke, the socially conscious, um, arresting um, and very lively poetry that, uh, that uh, pervaded this aisle in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, if you want to have a laugh, just look up a poem called Chicken Town by John Cooper Clarke to see what I mean, to see also the resemblance to InQ's work, uh, particularly this one, um, but uh, also in many other uh, works that he does. You can find his information on Spotify, as you can with several others. But I wanted to play it as an introduction because that, that, that piece, which is known as America, 
pretty succinctly draws together the many threads that we talk about, the many threads that are spoken about in this movement that have also um, been on the margins of um, the mental awakening of the human race since we realized that we were consuming resources on this planet in a very linear fashion. There's a great deal about buying stuff we don't need that is also shared by the millennial work of Fight Club. Um, and I, I thought it was a, a rather well put, rather succinct, very ballsy way of getting the information out in a way that still makes you chuckle. But if you listen very, very carefully to the edit, um, and if you listen to it's actually originally on YouTube, you can hear the audience humming in an agreeing tone, recognizing patterns of thought, recognizing the caricatures of their own thought processes and what is considered to be valid and important and promoted within the culture. So that's in cue set to the background of one of my favourite pieces, Peter Joseph's uh, Zeitgeist Requiem for One. So uh, this week we have uh, two set pieces for you. It's going to be a fairly brief show. I do apologise for that. Um, but we have, for, uh, for the first uh, portion, we have a interview with Ivan Munoz from Vigilante, the industrial uh, metal band um, and progressive rock band uh, Vigilante, who are at the moment based in Paris, as he goes into. I won't spoil too much more for you uh, on that front. Um, Ivan and, um, and Vigilante in general have been running a project to support the anonymous movement in a particular way, um, which he goes into at great depth. Um, we have an, uh, So that's about a half an hour interview we have with him. And then I'm starting... Because I don't want to just get every time I don't want to just jump on the radio and just talk talk to you about what I think. I'm going to start reviewing the many many books that the movement has drawn together to read that informs its worldview that feeds back on our stance with data and alternatives and ideas. And this, as we have um, admitted in the past, can be anything from the popular science book from writers like Bill Bryson or Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, even Albert Einstein has has produced popular science writing in the past, uh, all the way through academic journals and books and, and more sober works, the works that deal with collapse, for example, by uh, Jared Diamond, all the way through to what can be broadly described as fiction. Again, we end up at the the great shores of Carl Sagan, upon which one can crash one's vessel quite happily, um, and many others. Um, these uh, these books and these works that we draw upon and which contain a lot of the information that we speak about would be very useful to be reviewed on the air. So I'm going to start, personally, just reviewing the books that I've read, that I've found, that have been recommended to me by members of the movement, members of the public, um, family members, whatever, um, to try and bring them under the nose of the broader movement and whoever happens to be listening to ZM Global at the time. So this week I will be uh, reviewing The Third Industrial Revolution by Jeremy Rifkin. Jeremy Rifkin is known to many members of the movement for, for his work, The End of Work, um, and The Hydrogen Economy, um, and Age of Access. There's quite a few different works that he's done over the years. He's been active for a very a great uh, amount of time and is broadly, I would say, one of the economists who is focusing on the actual problems rather than getting that stock market ticker to go up rather than down <laughs> and explaining yesterday's headlines tomorrow. Um, so, yes, Rifkin kicks off this um, thought experiment of mine in the second half of the show. While I'm at it, I might as well uh, talk about this as well. Um, we, I, was, uh, I had the great fortune to be at the Zeitgeist Media Festival, like I've mentioned, the fact that I've played in queue as my opener. I had originally gone this year, only for a very brief amount of time, four days, to be just a participant, just a watch. But it didn't take very long for someone to suggest that I play the part of an aristocratic English banker <laughs> For the uh, for the for the set piece uh, performed by Master Zero, and I agreed without having seen the script because if you've ever seen Master Zero, and I would recommend that you, if you are listening to this, pop yourself on YouTube very briefly, type in Master Zero Z E R O, and just watch what you get, <laughs> because if you think that it's extreme of us to stand out on the street. Uh, or write lectures talking about the end of the monetary system 
and about um, a, a coming age of global abundance and access and interconnected networked fortitude and just general uh, living on this planet in line with the nature of the system that we are in fact bound by, making the most of things rather than hacking them into the least. If you think that that might be challenging, just you wait until you see the kind of tone that Master Zero is going for with its... I've never seen any dedication like this. I mean, we're talking three hours of makeup uh, preparation and months of rehearsals and, and digital photography and video all edited together with a very, very carefully planned beat process. All of that up to the very minute that you go on on stage for a 12 minute show <laughs> i've never seen anything like it it's quite wonderful and when you watch it i mean i have a very small part in it i'm no dancer and and, and it is mostly dance and physical theater driven i'm anybody who's ever met me knows that i can't do that um but i mean yeah when you see that just you wait just you just you send that to someone um and and see what their feedback on that is it's uh a brilliant piece of theatre. Really, really enjoyed. Great to be part of it in, in some small way. And um, and like I say, the kind of dedication that I have not seen before, or well, of course, because it was only a week ago, two weeks ago, I have not seen since. Um, there will be, in the coming months, um, several videos coming out of all of the people who played on that day. It's really quite a privilege to have met some of the people who were there it was a particular pleasure to meet Chad Fisher. Members of the movement will know Fisher best as Alex Jones. <laughs> um, Alex Jones, the, I mean, we might as well say right-wing American talk show host, not really a talk show host, sort of a media figure, um, who is easy to, easy to um, mimic, I suppose, because he's, he's got a very particular way about him. Chad Fisher rose to prominence um, parodying his style, particularly with respect to shouting about problems without never really offering tangible coherent solutions about actual technical results and technical efficiencies that can be implemented to really solve the ground of a problem. You don't give poor people more money, you fix the conditions that give rise to poverty. How do you do that? Well, what are the basic human needs that, when we take them away, create the system of poverty? Well, a lot of that's to do with nutrition, a lot of it's to do with education, energy availability, communications, transport, healthcare. It, it becomes rather obvious after a while and a little bit insulting that one even feels one has to still list these things. However, the, this is the kind of uh, information level that we're trying to get in on. And uh, I was always very impressed and have laughed multiple times at uh, watching Chad um, mimic Alex in a way that is very enjoyable. He didn't come there to to just be Alex Jones. He does actually have a fully-fledged comedy set, and it was wonderful, and I thanked him afterwards. Overall, it was um, a ridiculously busy day. Lots of people. The whole venue was full. It overran by an hour, and the whole venue was kind enough to let them carry on with absolutely no problems. Uh, so hats off to everyone at the Avalon, one of the great... One of the great places in, in, in Hollywood, one of the most famous uh, venues off on Hollywood and Vine, which is something that, I mean, even Brits like me know that address. So it's very, very, uh, it was a great pleasure. And I would recommend to everyone to watch out for the videos as and when they emerge. There is, of course, a lot still to be done. A huge amount of video editing that goes in with not very much free time um, that, we, that we have to spend on it. But it will be available and it will be available free. And it was absolutely worth every second of my um, four-day jaunt over to the States. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to now play the interview I recorded with Ivan uh, of Vigilante, and then after that, uh, I'll be back to introduce the book review of Jeremy Rifkin's Third Industrial Revolution. Hello, Ivan. Nice to have you on the show. Um, thanks very much for coming on, and uh, it's I'm looking forward to catching up with you after the last time I saw you with <laughs> April, I think, in Paris, wasn't it? Yes. No, I, I actually have been kind of busy, you know, uh, working in my new album and, you know, promoting my, my last single, looking That's for true. shows. Sure. So, I mean, for, the, for listeners who may not know who you are, could, can you describe the sort of the genre of your music and, and maybe how long you've been going on for, where you're based and where you normally play live shows? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, basically what I do is try to mix different kind of electronic music with uh, rock or metal and try to create something, a, an hybrid. And I don't know, I, I have been, uh, I have uh, two projects. One is uh, Vigilante <laughs> or Vigilante or how, <laughs> whatever, how you, you want to call it. And the other is Hopeless. Vigilante is more, um, I don't know, it's a mix of industrial, EBM, lately some dubstep influence, and Hopeless is totally more electronic and, I don't know, more, more melodic. And yeah, I've been uh, with these two projects around eight, seven years. And yeah, I've been going pretty well. I've been, I have been playing all over the world in United States, Russia, or Europe. And yes, that, that, that's it. <laughs> Mostly it's music. That's fantastic. And I, I, must, I must tell the listeners straight away that if anybody has Spotify, uh, you're, the Vigilante albums are up on there, aren't they? Including The New Resistance, is it? And there's yes. another one. The other one's called. Um, but they're both on there. That's, I go running to them. I actually use them for exercise. So. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and are you originally from South America? Yes. Yes, I I born in in Chile, um, a little country in South America that is very famous because we have a uh, 17 years of dictatorship. <laughs> yeah, sure, no. absolutely. Pinochet, right? Yes. Mm. Um, no, but now is uh, is okay. You know, it's mostly domained by the free market, but we live in a pseudo democracy, so it's it's. It's kind of better than before, but uh, it's not that that good. Right, sure. Could yeah, it's an, it's a, a slight material improvement with all of the materialist problems that attend that. <laughs> y- yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I can understand. But you've moved now, haven't you? You're you're European based now, aren't you? Yes, yes. I last year I moved here in in France. Okay. Uh, mostly to because I, I fall in love with a French woman. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't know, I was was very difficult, but uh, I don't know. In, in a way, I'm, me and, and her, we are kind of stubborn, so <laughs> we make it happen anyway. And we get married uh, this year, and yeah, now I'm officially here trying to to learn the language and try to adapt to the culture here because you know every every country have his own distinctive uh, culture yeah that's very true um look i mean your your music is fairly um uh, aggressively anti authoritarian like a lot of um I, I i don't know if it's something to do with the genre but that sort of industrial metal from ministry and nine inch nails it tends to have a sort of an activism aspect to it doesn't it there's something about it yeah. i mean all the way to like fear factory as well there's something about it that analyzes the the mechanistic approach to life or you know i mean it's that's a, a bad way of saying it but there seems to be an activist or, or anti-totalitarian orientation to most of it how would you say that you have found France, uh, you know, former seat of the French Revolution and the, you know, the terror and all that stuff. How have you found the, the activism side of things to be there compared with, let's say, South America, which has always, which has always had that sort of fiery, uh, Latin, if you like, sort of anti-authoritarianism. Um, I don't know. I, for me, it's kind of a huge contrast with my country because people, is a, is in the culture here to speak your mind, you know. Yeah, especially uh, uh, about criticize the the government or the politician when they do something that is not good for the people. In my country, it happened, but it didn't last too long because there's a lot of you know repression, and actually the um, the circumstances of the people didn't the, the people didn't have too much free time. You know, they have to work all day for very terrible wages. And basically, you, you, it's very difficult to have free time to, you know, 
protest or speak your mind. And I think here is kind of different because it's they have a bigger social net, so so you you have uh, that choice, you know. And you even and you even have have the choice to you know if if you don't don't want to. There is a very strong um, help to people that can, couldn't find jobs or or have a kind of different problems like health problems or drug drug addiction problems. There's a, I think it's, the view is a little bit more humane than in other countries. Interesting. Um, and I mean, have you found that you've been able to get involved? with uh, sort of activism in France, despite the language barriers or maybe uh, having less of a social circle than before in Chile? Well, um, since, since year I, I become an activist of the psychic movement, but uh, yeah. not, not only from the psychic movement, I, I always try to, to get aware about what is happening in the world with different, different kind of groups or ideas. So... Yeah, I I have been in contact with people, for example, from Anonymous, from sure. here, or from the Tiger Movement too. And yeah, there there's a lot of uh, social activism here in in everything that you can imagine. You know, the rights for women, the rights for animals, the the Tiger Movement, Anonymous. There, there's a lot of of thing happen. But uh, yeah, yeah, the 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 language is sometimes is a is a barrier. But I'm learning, <laughs> petit à petit, <laughs> hey, little you, little by little. And if you can speak about systemic uh, sustainability and efficiency of the the real world rather than the market system in French, you will have beaten me to the punch being able to speak about this in German because I can't. <laughs> it's the most bizarre thing ever. It's. Uh, it, it, it really takes something to be able to do it in two languages. Um, unfortunately, I've met um, people from the German chapters of uh, the Zeitgeist movement who can do it in both languages, whereas I cannot, and that always makes me feel incredibly guilty. Um, <laughs> but listen, um, speaking of anonymous, um, and by the way, I, th I think it's, a, it's not only a good thing, but an expected thing that you're probably dealing with um, anonymous and maybe the Occupy. I don't know how big Occupy was in France um, since it's so heavily socialist. In its in its outward application, it might have come across differently. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't I didn't follow it, um, but I, I always try and remind people when they say, "Oh, you should be doing more work with the Occupy people, and you should be doing more work with Anonymous, and you should be doing more work with every, every of ours, all these kind of people." I always like to remind them that it is all one big movement. Uh, it is all one group of people who are trying to um, inform the values. So. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're doing that. But on the subject of Anonymous, tell me what you're doing with this single that you've released recently, when it was released, and what you're doing, what that project is. Uh, well, it was released the 4th of July to celebrate the independence of... <laughs> it's kind of ironic because it's... <laughs> it's uh, I don't think... I think you say it's experienced something very... Very totally not uh, independent at all, you know, with all the surveillance systems and all, all the, the thing that is happening right there with the persecution of the whistleblowers and stuff like that. So I released it the 4th of July and mostly uh, I get in touch with some people from Anonymous and I really get touched because there's a lot of people that are now in jail just because they participate in some some kind of action, protest action, you know, uh, and and they are judged with a stronger sentences than a pedophile, you know. It's uh, they was just trying to you know expose some some companies that were doing something not right to to the people, and they are punished very 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 bad and i i really want to do something about it because of course we can <laughs> talk endlessly you know about the problems in the world but i think in one point you need to take action you know even if it's uh, something little you know uh i don't know so i decide to you know in, in 
uh, try to support the the people that are in jail from Anonymous. And all the money raised by the single will be donated to. It's, it's kind of a group called Free Anons, and they take care of you know pay the fees to the lawyers and stuff like that. That of course they 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 can afford. You know the people in here can afford that kind of of thing. So yeah, it was I don't know I I. I wanted to to do something about it, so I do that. That's really good. I mean, how 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 um how has the uptake of the single been? And has anybody asked you, by the way, how you know that the people from Anonymous that you've got in touch with really are from Anonymous? Because the whole point of them is that they're anonymous. Yes. <laughs> no, of course. But the thing uh, the 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 thing is that everyone I I have different reaction from people because there are people that say, yeah, Anonymous is a very good idea, right? And another, they say, no, it's so terrible. It's only a couple of kids in a basement, you know, playing to change the world. Um, I don't know. Other people say that uh, mostly they are thief, you know, that they steal credit card uh, numbers. Um, but it's totally, <laughs> most, most of the opinions are based on, you know, what media tell you, you know. So yeah, of course the problem with anonymous is is anonymous. So <laughs> could be you know could be anyone, and it's very difficult to identify when an an action from anonymous is something real or not. But um, mostly um, the 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 reaction I I perceived was was good. Um, for me, I. I really want to, you know, take action now because these are people that have a face now. You know, they are suffering the consequence of trying to help us. You know, try to help uh, humanity, and now they have a face. They are not anonymous anymore, but they, 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 uh, it's a. I I don't know if. <laughs> If you can understand me, it's like now there are victims of that. You know, is the I think it's the first time that I, that we can see. You know that all the the action of anonymous have a consequence, and the consequence is there are a lot of people that is paying for for that. So I think it's very important to you know support these people because if not, it, it will not gonna be. Uh, more more people like this you know because pe- people get scared I, I agree completely with you i mean one of the things that we've seen with edward snowden that we've seen with julian assange bradley manning everybody who has been a major whistleblower who's con- contributed literally millions of pages into the public domain about horrific secrets that have not endangered the people who are involved but have only experienced uh, uh, shown you the the, the 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 methods of how these these power machinations work and what the effects actually are. Um, they, I think what's understood very well by any governing force in the world is that as soon as you get them into a trial situation or you lock them away in jail, the interest from the public drops considerably. Yes. Because people go, well, they got caught, that's a shame. But hey, all those secrets were amazing, weren't they? And that sort of paves the way for no one else to take over because they know that the first consequence is that the system will it, it's very much assert itself on your life will lock you away, and that even the well-meaning people who were supporting you before don't have the means or the emotional energy to try and access and lobby for you when you're not visible anymore, you know, yes. um, all the rest of it. I mean, Bradley Manning people mostly forgot about, you know. Yeah, for um, me, for me, that that is the sad part, you know, because I remember when just Anonymo uh, show up, you know, with the PayPal, MasterCard uh, yeah. operation, and supporting um, the Occupy movement, all the people kind of cheer, cheer them up, you know, was like, yeah, Anonymous is, uh, you know, because their actions was uh, very powerful, even if it's not that totally, you know, uh, a big solution to, to our problems, but it, in a way, make people think about it or empower people. That mm-hmm. I, for me, for, for me, that's the more important, you know, because most of us, 
but uh, stop people mostly that can have a view or, or critics to the system uh, they are stopped by you know they say yeah but what I can do what I can change I'm I'm no one I'm nothing you know that that's the that's the kind of feeling that most of the people have so they 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 are, are kind of victims of that so with anonymous I I think that empower a lot of people and yeah you know people will start to speak their mind and be be able to to see that you know you you can in a way fight back you know in a specific uh, way um and i don't know for me that that's the that's the thing i appreciate appreciate more from from anonymous that give uh, kind of people hope uh, but the thing is, yeah, when they get caught, it's like what you say. It's like, oh, bad luck, yeah. you know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not such a good idea to get involved with that, or maybe I will keep uh, just watching my TV and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. This is what happens to you when you step out of line. Now, now get back in the pen. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right. It's, and I understand that completely. I mean, and just think of the other ways it works. It works even by, I don't know, people who are just, uh, doing normal things like standing up and just delivering a speech on something. Um, if, it goes in the, if it goes in a particular, I don't know, medium, gets very, very hyped, um, does that person then worry about whether they're going to lose their job, you know? Yes. Uh, is losing your job a surefire way of getting shut up? You know, it's... it's, it's it's almost like there is no avenue that's safe, and there can't be. If there were a safe avenue to um, produce some real discourse about alternative, real-world technical solutions to anything, um, then it would be too easy to get out of this system. Wouldn't it be too easy to yes. advertise an alternative to a system that thrives on there being no alternative, um, or at least to, to employ the rhetoric of no alternatives? Um, so, I mean, uh, I hope it's. I hope the single's been well. Do you want to? Do you want to give out the um, the URL to where people can get this? I ha I have myself not got it yet, so I need to go and do that. Um, <laughs> you hear this for free or otherwise? What What have we got? Um, mostly, you can go to uh, vigilant point, point cl slash or time, and you can find there uh, how to to buy it on iTunes or Bandcamp or Nimbit or several other. Okay, so you're on you're on all the major platforms. Okay, so that was vigilante, as we would say in English. Dot cl. Yes. Forward slash our time. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Fantastic. Good. I'd recommend everyone goes here. I did hear an, uh, an early cut. I can't remember which one made it into the final, but you've got elements of dubstep in your um, in your uh, angry form. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, because you know, as a musician, I I kind of get bored to do all the time the same thing. So I always try to you know keep evolving because if not, uh, I don't know. I I think. Uh, we all should do that in, in every kind of art because if not, we just get stuck, you know, and we just are a copy or a copy of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, actually, I heard, you know, Abby Martin from Russia today, don't you? You'll, you'll probably know her. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the American. She was, um, she was at the Zeitgeist Media Festival showcasing her art, and she mentioned a very famous line by Nina Simone. Uh, I'll paraphrase probably to the point of butchery. Um, she said that um, art, in order to be truthful, must reflect the times. And it's very similar to what Ernst Fischer said as well, who, of course, it gets quoted at the beginning of Zeitgeist Addendum. Yes. Art must reflect the times, and if those times are decay, then art must reflect decay. Yes. Uh, in order to change the world and all the rest. I think I butchered that one as well. Um, surely it's what art is, is the product of its environment and the product of its times. I mean, it can deliberately not be, I suppose, but that itself is also <laughs> can be then seen as uh, needfully retrospective uh, in a way that is also deliberately a, a product of that time. Yeah, and in fact, as a friend of mine who's sitting here listening to this, <laughs> that it's about it's about the self, isn't it? And of course, the self is of course at once a culmination of and a reflection of the times as well. So your art has to be is is only relevant by being in situ as well as something that can be revisited from a future standpoint. Um, it's going to be very interesting, I think, in twenty years when people look back at the art that was generated now. Anything that isn't 
explicitly about trying to combat the problems of the times will hopefully be seen as a phenomenally dishonest and <laughs> wait <laughs> yes so I, i'm always was... thrilled when i see artists that i love doing things that aren't necessarily to their benefit i would put it that way yes no but also i i think that for example especially in music um uh, music has become in, in some ways you know like a kind of a uh, way to evade yourself from reality also you know when mm. th there's a lot especially in the in the mainstream pop or or the more mainstream mainstream uh, electronic music it's just about you know uh, having fun forget your problems party you know it's like Let's forget about all the problems and just have fun. And I think it, for me, it's kind of normal because with all the issues that we have every day, of course, people want to a little of, you know, have, having a break. But I don't know. I, I don't force to, or I, I will not tell to every artist that they have to have a social message or something but uh, I think, yeah, with all the issues that we have today, is, I, I, I couldn't, you know, live with myself to, to, and, and do nothing, you know. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Am I right in thinking that some of the proceeds from our time, your single, is going to the Electronic Frontier Foundation as well? Yes. Yes, that, that's uh, something that I received uh, that news recently. Because um, I was trying to play in the DEF CON, you know, it's a convention of hackers in in United States. DEF CON. Yes. Um, I haven't heard of it, but it's like, was it like a festival? Uh, mostly it's a convention of hackers, even hackers. if that sounds crazy, but yeah, it is. <laughs> no, it's like... there's, there's, there are a few of them. There's uh, Hack the Planet, I think, and there's a few yes. other ones. Jennifer Biafra spoke at one of them. Having never used a computer in his life, he spoke about techno hacktivism. Yes. I think hacktivism might have even come from him, but he certainly employed it there. But no, these these are wonderful events because um, hacking is just another form of the immune system. I mean, if there's a there's a really great speaking of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, actually, there's a a very very good former copyright lawyer, now turned general freedom activist called Lawrence Lessig. Um, uh, who wrote a book in the early 2000s called Free Culture. It was the very first book I read about activism at all of any kind that got me into thinking about systemic consequences of our behaviors. And um, he, he had a, a fundamental, his big quotation that sort of sold his ideas was code is law. He said, doesn't matter what the law says, if the code forbids certain behaviors, certain sharings, certain ways of viewing things, then that code has become a law in the internet. And the code predominantly of the internet before that was one of openness, the idea of an end-to-end -end peer technology, where the innovations, the changes, the updates come from the users rather than from a central network owner. And that gradually the commercialization and corporatization of the internet has meant the inverse of that. And yes. that they can, as long as you implement the code, it doesn't matter what you lobby for or what the, the rights you think you have. If the code behaves a certain way, it is law. It's it's a thing that happens. Its consequences mapped out through the the function of the architecture of the system, and that really caught me. That was the first time I'd I'd heard that. I know it's being from the 2000s. It's actually very very late on that that thinking I think has existed um, because you've got people like Buckminster Fuller and oh, John. Yes. We've talked about this since forever, but that was the first time I'd really seen it become relevant to me. Um, so hopefully the Electronic Frontier Foundation's work, which is broadly speaking, let's see if I get this right. Are they essentially legal help for people who are fighting this, the, the, the cause of a free Internet, fighting for the cause of a free Internet? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mostly that. And the people, they also support to, to you know, they, they have been supported to some people from Anonymous too. And yeah, it's mostly about the... Uh, your, your your freedom, you know, the, your privacy, because uh, yeah, if, if you, for example, with all the scandal that happened with the NSA, well, they they are, you know, the knowledge and and they they are the people that are kind of suing, you know, and trying to to make more visible these kind of issues because uh, it's a uh, yeah. 
it, it's probably that they they fight for the freedom of internet that I think is very very important, especially these days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've sued huge companies before, haven't they? I think they've taken Google to court a couple of times about their privacy, and they they highlight sort of privacy issues on Facebook as well. Like every time they change their terms of use, come on, who reads that, right? Whoever reads the the pages of legalese about the most important thing that you're about to sign up to, which is what they do with your data. <laughs> yeah. The rest of it, but these guys turn it into human readable language. They explain what's so dangerous, and they actually go and sue companies. Yes. Um, Based on that, I, th I think they're incredibly important. I th I'm sort of ashamed that I've never given them any money, um, which I know <laughs> be all and end all. But I think I might start doing that. Yes. Um, as they keep reminding people, it is tax deductible, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to finish the story, the thing I, I was trying to, you know, play in, in Defcom. Maybe I will play the next year. So one of the organizers told me that they were uh, building a compilation to help to, you know. The, this organization, so I say, yeah, of course, and I give him a song, and voila. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's really good. Are you on that? Yeah, you're on that compilation now, right? Yeah, I think yes. I saw this. It's got a really cool front cover as well. It's quite um, shepherd fairy like, the very ornate, um, <laughs> symmetrical, um, but somehow practically monochrome in its in its choosing of, I think, red and, and brown. Yeah, it looks really cool. That's really great, man. Congrats on that. That's fantastic. Um, and, and look, and for anybody who's in the the France area or whatever, like, um, have you got any upcoming shows? Because there is, unfortunately, a band called Vigilante in the UK who overlap with you on, on Spotify. So when I was listening to your music, it said, oh, by the way, there's a live show in London. And I immediately <laughs> said, how could you not tell me about this? He said, hey, it's somebody else. Yes. <laughs> so, have you got any sort of shows coming up where people can catch you and maybe uh, meet you afterwards? Mostly, I'm more, you know, working in my in my new album because uh, I don't know. I really want to, you know, make it right, you know, because uh, sometimes when you, you know, you tour and you 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 compose at the same time is sometimes the result is not that good. So I'm just trying to dedicate my time to that. But I will I will gonna make a couple of these sets. Uh, here in France to promote the single cool. and yeah uh, mo mostly that and yeah the, the people can check it in vigilant.cl or or in my in the Facebook page that is um, facebook.com slash vigilant band okay fantastic I'll, really what I'll do is I'll put all of the links in the show description sure uh, people can find them and and hook up. I know that a great many of our members already know who you are and listen to your music and and all the rest of it. Um, and you you also have the benefit of having a rather good visual editing skills because you come up with some nice graphics. I think um, to sort of um, communicate the general tone of, of the kind of music you're doing. So um, listen, man, it's been great having you on the show. Please keep doing everything you're doing because. Um, <laughs> It's the art that changes the world, you know, it is. Thank you very much, sir. Well, I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. And good luck with the rest of uh, the sales for the single. I hope you raise as much as you can <laughs> for those brave anons who are sitting almost forgotten in prison cells. Yes. So that's really no, and I really thank you for for this uh, this interview. And I don't know, I hope uh, I, I go see you soon. Absolutely, man. I got to pop over to France and see you again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Book Review of the Third Industrial Revolution by Jeremy Rifkin. I begin with a striking quotation of his, which is not from the book, but from a, a lecture that was given around the same time as The Empathic Civilization, another book that he wrote. The line is this, The basic economy on this planet is photosynthesis. Long-time listeners or members of TZM who have looked at the reading which informs the movement's attitude towards economics the environment and social and technical realities will know Mr. Rifkin's name. He is the author of a much quoted meta study of technological unemployment, both past, present, and future, named The End of Work. That book, already quite an old entry in the recent literature on technological unemployment, having appeared in 1995, is in fact cited a few times in the Third Industrial Revolution as a background factor in the emerging decentralized yet networked world which we find our technological applications shaping, or at least allowing and enabling, for the first time in our history. 
It is recommended on its own merits as a book, as well as in the role of companion piece to this shorter tome, providing, as it does, some key statistics on the erosion of meaningful or necessary work in the coming years. Many of the problems that Rifkin outlines in this book are very well known to a great many listeners by now, although one notices immediately within this book that the statistics are heavily American-centric. The general global statistic is present. 40% of the world lives on $2 or less, page 5. Whatever the $2 actually denotes in real life need is never made clear. Rather, one feels the point of the statistic in the first place. American wages have been levelling off and declining since the 1980s, which was the maturation of the second industrial revolution, page 11. And the market economy instead transmogrifying to one more and more centred around money creation from pre-existing money than the slightly more pragmatic and tangible economy that had preceded it. Unemployment, charted particularly in 2009 in this work, page 14, has continued its downward slide, disguised as a constant figure by the media through the peeling off of the statistics of workers who have been permanently discouraged from the job market. Counting these figures as one with the official unemployment figures of 10%, actual 2009 unemployment figures were at 17.6%. Household debt is now greater than household income, at some 130%, in fact. We are literally involved in an anti-economy. Other worrisome but recognisable hallmarks are here too. The peak production of oil is long past 1970, according to page 7, and the long grinding decline and disruption of oil through supply, price increases and environmental degradation is now both the need for and in some senses the catalyst for a reorganisation of our economy based on new technologies. A study from 2011 by the American Petroleum Institute finds that even drilling in every possible oil reserve of the US would add 10 million barrels a day by 2030, or less than 10% of current US oil consumption. These efforts do little to extend the robustness of oil as an energy source for the coming era. At the heart of this reorganisation, then, is the following general understanding. It is not coincidental that the end of the oil era is also the end of traditional authoritarian regimes, uh, the book claims on page 11. In fact, the new industrial paradigms are born out of new forms of communications and new possibilities for energy harnessing by a society working in tandem upon the architecture of that society. Rifkin puts it like this. Infrastructure, at the deepest level, is not a static set of building blocks that serves as a kind of fixed foundation for economic activity, as we've come to regard it in popular economic law. Rather, infrastructure is an organic relationship between communications technologies and energy sources that, together, create a living economy. Communications technology is the nervous system that oversees, coordinates and manages the economic organism and energy is the blood that circulates through the body politic, providing the nourishment to convert nature's endowment into the goods and services to keep the economy live and growing. Infrastructure is akin to a living system that brings increasing numbers of people together in more complex economic and social relationships. That's from the Kindle locations of 714 to 719. Rifkin identifies the networked wealth of the Internet as a model for future energy use. He calls it the Internet of Energy. Decentralized, decentrally gathered renewable energy by its nature is not in one place like oil uh, and does not dictate a ground-up harvesting and delivery system for humanity. This, he terms, is called the Intergrid Rifkin goes on to outline what he considers to be the five pillars of the Third Industrial Revolution. This move to a disposition and logic of a central nervous system of Earth cohabitation. One, shifting to renewable energy. Two, transforming the building stock of every continent into micro-power plants to collect renewable energies on site. Three, deploying hydrogen and other storage technologies in every building and throughout the infrastructure to store intermittent energies. 4. Using internet technology to transform the power grid of every continent into an energy-sharing intergrid 
that acts just like the internet when millions of buildings are generating a small amount of energy locally on site they can sell surplus back to the grid and share electricity with their continental neighbors and five transitioning the transport fleet to electric plug-in and fuel cells vehicles that can buy and sell electricity on a smart continental interactive power grid Rifkin envisions the refitting of entire cities under what are called master plans for decentralized energy and communications, the kind of city that might emerge were these systems already themselves dominant. His website, the thirdindustrialrevolution.com, features master plans for Rome and Monaco, detailing at some hundred pages the city planning required to leverage these particular technologies. Several further plans were also developed for the United States, including for San Antonio. Readers who wish for a lesson in how the media is used, deliberately or as a byproduct of ignorance, to belittle attempts at real upgrades to extant cities, need only peruse the story of the attempted San Antonio master plan, which begins on page 77 and runs for the rest of the chapter. The story is one of miscommunication and the labelling of any new redesign of a local economy as too expensive focusing only on short-term costs in dollars, often poorly calculated, as is the case with this story, and never factors longer-term costs of doing nothing. A polluted and unlivable environment is at once the most costly to us and the least valuable, therefore, to us. It seems perhaps the world is finally noticing this. The discussion of energy and the physical organisation of power provides the ballast for the first part of the work, Part 2, entitled Lateral Power, more firmly grasps the real issue, for our real issues are not technical. Were they such, we would have no alternative energy and new developments in communications to discuss at all. The real issue, both parallel and corollary, is the present decentralized uh, power and organization and monopolistic owner mentality that both produced and was an ideological product of the prior Industrial Revolution. The ability to concentrate capital, the essence of modern capitalism, is critical to the effective performance of a system as a whole. The centralized energy infrastructure, in turn, sets the conditions for the rest of the economy, encouraging similar business models across every sector. Rifkin in Part 2. How can this organizational set of behaviors be changed? By definition, the movers and shakers hold all the keys and guard all the gates. While focusing on the increasing disparity between rich and poor, and the ever more distant sets of needs of each class, and the ability to even produce or provide a responsive society via pyramidal bureaucracy, Rifkin outlines a collaborative economy, gaining strength and usefulness via its distributed energies, distributed in instant telecommunications, achieving the representation always promised by traditional voted-for politicians. Self-interest is subsumed by shared interest, opines Rifkin on page 107, accidentally echoing the exact sentiments of the Zeitgeist movement, which calls for the necessary priority of social interest over individual interest as the methods by which individual interest is itself met efficiently, tangibly, and broadly. Linux, Wikipedia, and the networks which have evolved around content delivery, such as file sharing in general and BitTorrent in particular, are all cited as elements of the collaborative economy impinging on traditionally niche-produced specializations of economic behavior, now open source and already in operation within the economy of today, albeit as revolutionary tools being used for anti-revolutionary goals, decentralized means for centralized ends. Much is made of the possibilities of decentralized industrial production via 3D printing, itself the end of warehousing, just in case of uh, stocking of goods and physical elements, um, instead of the just-in-time model of printing on demand of goods and physical necessities envisioned here. The end game is a networked society of individuals able to harness and produce their own energy, manufacture and design their own goods, communicate with anyone through freely available means, access the vast stores of knowledge that are the result of humanity's inquisitive few millennia on this planet, 
and a society of individuals who innovate as end-to-end -end agents in a network which gains its power and flexibility from precisely the lack of central government, instead promoting decentralised governance. Listeners wishing to understand this particular differenti differentiation further are recommended the lecture Thinking in Systems by Jason Lord at Z-Day in March 2013, which they will find on YouTube. Further thought experiments abound in this work, from community-organized agriculture, car sharing, which a study in Europe shows has cut emissions by 50%, that lists on page 115, to many other familiar examples of millennial models of technology. But Rifkin sees the real revolution as being a partnership between government and industry. Quoting from page 120, Many Americans have long harbored the notion that the great economic advances are always the result of the government getting out of the way and allowing the invisible hand of capitalism free reign in an unfettered market. Europeans and other societies around the world are far less convinced of the virtues of wide-open libertarian cat capitalism and have historically shown a preference for proactive government involvement in the economic process in order to maintain a more balanced social market model. Still, even among the more temperate social welfare economies, there is a growing populist sentiment, but still a minority, for pushing back the government's traditional role in the economy right at the time when we need a more activist government involvement within the private sector to regrow commerce and trade. Faced with the record government deficits and high taxes, millions of disgruntled voters are rightfully concerned about mortgaging their future in a heap of unpayable debt and saddling their children with a bankrupt society. But believing somehow that if the government were to stand down, the entrepreneurial spirit would be unleashed, new economic opportunities would abound, and the general welfare of the human race would be vastly improved, does not square with the historical record. Reality check. While the market has been an unrivaled commercial engine for promoting inventiveness and entrepreneurialism, it has never, on its own, created an economic revolution. Quite simply, this is a myth that continually rears its head in the American psyche, attracting converts amongst the disaffected. The sham is tolerable in good times, but in this critical moment in human history, when our very survival and the future of our planet are at stake, we can no longer afford to dwell in a mystical land of magical thinking. Economic revolutions don't just emerge from the ether. The laying down of a new communications and energy infrastructure has always been a joint effort between the government and industry. The cherished laissez-faire idea that economic revolutions flow inexorably from the partnering between inventors and entrepreneurs, with the first risking his or her time coming up with a new technology, product or service, and the second willing to invest his or her capital to get the new idea to market, is only part of the story. Both the first and second industrial revolutions required a large-scale government commitment in terms of public funds to build the infrastructure. Government also established the codes, regulations and standards to manage the new flow of economic activity and it created generous tax incentives and subsidi subsidies to, assume, sorry, to assure, the, assure the growth and stabilization of the new economic order. And it created general tax incentives and subsidies to assure the growth and stabilization of the new economic order. But, as both current events and the Third Industrial Revolution as a book themselves do show, the move from a top-down capitalist-controlled industrial revolution of centralized efficiency of action and ownership and restriction to a wider, reactive, decentralized and more equitable, as well as more technically efficient, access culture is fraught with resistance, myth, disbelief, and deliberate as well as accidental sabotage. The greatest sabotage in our present culture comes from actions of the preconditioned mind upon its environment. Education, meanwhile, is presented here in this book and in many other works, which will be reviewed on this show in the coming months, as the ultimate net gain of the environment upon the mind, that in turn, when applied, unlocks the door to the next era of survival and further education for that mind and the minds it fashions along the way from the process of successful life cycles. All in all, the Third Industrial Revolution is a useful statistics-filled tome of impressive brevity for its scope, 
for those wishing to begin their research into city planning, the alternatives for energy, transportation and telecoms, but should be seen as entry level only. Combine it with The End of Work, also by Rifkin, and Critical Path by Buckminster Fuller, for a strong tripartite on the role of work and the role of networks. Add in Yochai Benkler's Wealth of Networks or Lawrence Lessig's Free Culture for a greater understanding of why networks produce abundance and assist so much in collaborative value. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of our show for this week. Um, we have instituted a roughly bi-monthly schedule for ZM Global, as Jason mentioned last week. However, we find ourselves within a plethora of subjects to cover at the moment. So, in fact, for the next few weeks at least, we will be running weekly and we'll endeavour to do so with the fallback guarantee always being that there will be at least two a month and they will usually be once every two weeks. Um, however, next week we will have uh, Matt Berkowitz on to talk about, to to actually speak with a gentleman, an anarcho capitalist who he was debating recently. The video of which uh, is on YouTube now um, to to flatten out some of the discussions they were having. And then after that, we have Matt Berkowitz on again with myself and with uh, Thomas Anderson, I think his name is, who is a uh, one of our coordinators from. Österreich from Austria, um, to speak about vegetarianism and veganism particularly. This may seem uh, slightly off topic, I would imagine, to people who are used to hearing us for our economics. But of course, the whole point about a value shift has everything to do with the way that we consume everything and, and how what we consume impacts the systems, whether they be our systems of our bodies or the systems of the environment. So there'll be uh, discussions on veganism and vegetarianism. At some point in the future, I will be interviewing a vegan chef called Victoria, who is a member of our movement and who got in touch a while back, to also flesh out some of this information on veganism, vegetarianism as well, the science behind it, the ethics behind it, everything. Uh, this is in part a learning exercise out loud for myself, who is really only engaged with with um, diet and with nutrition really very recently. So I'm I'm not here to... Um, to do anything but learn over the next few weeks. Um, and then we will eventually have Jim Phillips back again. It'll be all the usual players, um, all the usual subjects, plus a few new ones as well. I will be back myself at some point to dish out another book review or two and find some more people to interview as well and to generally um, f push forward the information of a globally awakening, uh, it's a fanciful way of putting it, but a, a globally unified system of human thought and action in tandem and in harmony with the life system supports that we have been so lucky to study in our short tenure on this planet. Um, so anyway, there we go. Thank you very much for listening, and I will speak to you soon, and we will be back next week. I've got a crystal house for my missile mind that locks on to the things that I wish were defined. In a blanket of stars or a ripple of time where we get to stop, pause, fast forward, or rewind. See, we are all going nowhere. So I became a nomad with no cares, a notepad scribbling soothsayer, a truth slayer with a pen as a sword, swinging a cyclone simile the same as before. See, I am trouble devised inside a subtle disguise in a fake little bubble with a city inside. It's all marketing lies, because five guys in a high rise decide to supersize your fries. So now you've got an ass that is big enough to ride, and you can start a fire from the friction in your thighs. You're sitting on your Velcro couch with a chicken pot pie and a cell phone pouch and a flat screen life like I'm about to buy a bunch of shit that I don't need. Huh? I mean what? I get a credit card. I can afford these. I'm gonna get a better car. I'm gonna get a bigger house. I'm gonna get an iPhone. I'm gonna get a leather couch. I get a gym membership that I won't use. I'm gonna pop prescription pills and drink booze. I'm a cop micro fake boobs. I'm a get a pair of baby alligator shoes and a three piece suit. I'm a legend in my own mind. I vote Republican, but I work in the coal mines. I got a fat gut in a George Foreman grill. I got a MacBook loading up my acting reel. I got a pool that I never clean. I'll take a Hummer limousine to the Evergreens, hunt with an M16 and kill everything. I got a barbed wire tattoo because that shit looks menacing. I leave the house with the lights on. 
My favorite part of the day is feeding mice to my python. I don't believe global warming exists. It's a myth. Scientists have invented the shit. And I admit there's some climate differences, but that's it. It's just a normal planetary shift. Dude, get a grip. I drive a Mustang, so my mustache is a must-have. <laughs> I wear a musk that is made from a muskrat's nutsack. <laughs> I have a Snuggie, two pending lawsuits, and a daughter that is thin enough to hula hoop a Fruit Loop. I pick up my wife's dog's Pomeranian poop. My therapist has a therapist, so it's like a whole support group, you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Right? I mean, I'm pro-life and I'm pro-death penalty, and essentially the pressure has been fucking with me mentally. God, tell me what to do. I know that no one is as hypocritical as you. Isn't that true? Oh, we should get some new shoes. <laughs> Let's hit the mall, y'all. Shop till we feel used. I want it all. Call Janie. Tell her where we are. Well, fuck it, you can just record it on our DVR. I'll text her from the car. But bring me Xanax, because Amber's dating Xander, and it's making me all manic. I saw them at the standard getting hammered, and I panic. I just don't understand it. He's taking me for granted. I haven't felt this bad since I saw the Titanic. And to be perfectly candid, I can barely stand it. <laughs> I want to cry, and I don't know why. I want to die, but instead I get Go to hide and hide. I'll do anything to distract me from me. Distract me from me. I just want to be the people that I see on TV. I'm the land of the brave and the almost free. I am America, and I'm beautiful as can be.